Hello all, uh, welcome to another episode of uh, DirectShift Stories. This is your host Raj. Again, today we are joined by our COO with uh, one of our special guests for this morning, Iman uh, Saimi. Iman completed her master's in social work degree and her internships in clinical therapy for from California State uh, Fullerton, class of 2020. She's also a graduate of the IOK, uh, IOK seminar holding uh, an associate's degree in Islamic studies and Arabic. So today's talk will be uh, very interesting and let's hope that all the dynamic women worldwide, not only in Orange County or Los Angeles County or in US, everybody, uh, she's helping lots of uh, people out there through mental health with her Islamic studies background to provide a nurturing environment for learning and support. So in fact, uh, if you are a mom, if you are anybody out there uh, who is uh, working on um, your own personal uh, upbringing, probably if you're looking for your own development, you should be uh, listening to today's uh, guest. She's the loving mother of two boys and uh, working for a dedicated community uh, serving the IOK community. So in summary, Iman is a clinical social worker. She's providing range of social work services, including treatment for mental illnesses through individual couples and group therapy. So um, let's also find out in the mental health field, um, there is a new shift. Let's hear it from uh, our CEO, Wamshi, as well as to what uh, we are doing for the clinician community. I guess uh, Iman had, might have refreshed her screen, so she should be joining her in a couple of minutes. Uh, in the field of education uh, or public and private schools, she was a teacher. She was a weekend school principal uh, for past 15 years uh, with the kind of master's degree which she had um, in leadership. So uh, over to you, Wamshi. Um, Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, Raj. Uh, we'll give, uh, there she is, our special guest for today. Thank you. Um, uh, Iman, thanks for joining us. Um, all of you over there, like Raj mentioned, we are privileged to have Iman here with us today. She is not only a great social worker, a great therapist, the double masters and a great humanitarian. She's doing a lot of work in the area of providing care, especially providing mental health care beyond boundaries. So we'll hear from her on how she came to where she is today and what are her recommendations to uh, fellow healthcare workers and patients. And more importantly, what is her work in the space of providing mental health care beyond cultural social boundaries or barriers? So without much further ado to you all, I present you Iman Saime. Iman, welcome. Thanks for being a part of our podcast. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and for the introduction. I appreciate the time that we'll be spending together talking about mental health and uh, my journey into mental health and the ways I choose to serve. And I uh, hope this will be a beneficial segment to those who will listen to the program and will benefit from it. So the mental health field is a new shift for me after serving in the education field as a teacher for 10 years and as a school principal for five years and noticing certain patterns that I keep seeing with kids and families who are having hard time connecting and uh, kids who would be in trouble often will be in the you know principal's office for discipline. And these uh, children would fall under three categories that I felt that would uh, really zero down on what needs to be addressed. So some kids would have mental illnesses that haven't been addressed that needs to be diagnosed and treated. Perhaps the parents don't are not aware of it or the parents um, are not able to take the first step towards treatment. The second category would be a dispute between the parents, between the spouses, and there are problems at home. And the kids, when they come uh, to the class, they're just acting out out of... Um, you know, unprocessed emotions. And the third category would be parenting style that's not a match with the kids. And I just felt like I wanted to serve differently. So I did pursue my second master's in social work from Cal State Fullerton 
here in Orange County, California. And I've been uh, starting my journey into that uh, mental health field through providing therapy through different uh, venues. So I was at a hospital uh, as an internship and the second inter internship was at a school base um, uh, internship. And currently I serve as, as a clinical therapist in a private practice. And I address issues of, you know, between in, in families, parents, parenting style, generational traumas, childhood, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, feelings and emotions that haven't been processed to really invest in the clients to see their higher potential in their healing journey. So that's how I came into the mental health field. Great. That's a very, very impressive and um, interesting personal story, I must say. Thank so you. the shift from the teaching field, which you know is a great profession and great service in itself, now on to helping people potentially take care of themselves through mental health care, through you know the social work and clinical therapy that you're providing. So was there a was there a specific trigger, Iman, that you saw that you know I'm sure you've seen multiple kinds of challenges the kids were facing, and then was there a special reason or trigger that you were able to found the root causes of those issues in actually the mental health care that the kids and the parents may not be receiving? How did how did that quote unquote realization or recognition of the root causes happen? Very good question. So when I saw a decline in their academic skills and their performances, when I wasn't able to, um, you know, provide what is needed on the educational level in a school, uh, you know, school level, I felt like the, that, you know, certain cases would need special uh, catering to their situations. And when spending time talking to the parents and having uh, parent teachers conferences and monitoring the, you know, the behavior of the kid, each kid, I mean, depends on the case, um, I was able to tie the, the missing link and yeah. I was able to provide that information to the parents. Some parents followed through and they were able to pursue therapy and treatment plans. And some parents felt it wasn't what they wanted to hear so at the end of the day, if uh, the parents are not ready to accept the, the advice from the academic standpoint, um, really the, the problem will keep happening and it will keep circulating correct. around itself until something gets happened, gets correct, done. Correct, correct. correct. That's, you know, that's a great point. Um, as I think, just into just look into myself or the close community that I'm a part of, to be very frank, therapy still continues to be a stigmatic word, if there is even such expression. You know, there is a lot of stigma mm -hmm. attached with therapy, mm -hmm. especially when you talk about kids and when you talk about therapy needs for kids. I think the patient parents are automatically trying to be defensive or trying to not talk about it, et cetera, et cetera. So how is that getting better or, or do you think the school environment has to do more in order to eliminate that stigma as a teacher yourself and now progressing into your clinical therapy what experiences can you share that can translate to potential recommendations on how to eliminate some of those stigma in patients i am seeing more and more awareness and adoption of mental health healthcare now i frankly do not know statistically if it is where it needs to be. But in your experience, what are some of those recommendations that you would give potentially to kids in school environment, parents that have kids in the schools in order to get rid of that stigma? Well, awareness is key. And mm -hmm. I think some parents, they would just need to know more before yeah. they venture into that treatment plan. And uh, at times we have um, limited religious and cultural understanding of the importance of mental health. And the therapist gets to have a di diversified conversation with the parents. And it's very important for the, for the therapist to be equipped with the cultural competency 
in order right. for her or him to be able to handle these conversations. Because at the end of the day, parents have fear of stepping in the unknown, and that is a new territory for them. They don't know what the treatment plan looks like. They don't know if they're going to end up feeling bad about neglecting certain rights or certain responsibilities that they should have been doing. So I think like really facilitating, a heart, it's almost like heart to heart conversation to really get them to see the investment for them in the long run and the benefit in their, in their participation in pursuing that. I think um, on a school level, uh, you know, as far as the school is concerned, we are, you know, the schools of teachers are limited to what they could provide because really that is not their training. That is not their focus. Now with the, with, with COVID, you know, happening to all of us glo uh, globally, it changed a lot of perspectives and a lot of ways we are approaching education. You know, mm -hmm. now we're incorporating more of, uh, you know, psychoeducation about mental health in the curriculum. We're talking about anxiety. We're talking about depression. We're talking about uh, loneliness and how to deal with this uh, fatigue and, and Zoom fatigue and being home all day. And we're talking about physical activity and the importance of taking care of oneself. So I think the awareness is coming on on its own. Mm -hmm. uh, the stigma is still there, but we get to facilitate those uncomfortable conversations for us to build a new understanding. No, that's a great point. It's a great point. I think I think the awareness is increasing. You're right. It is it is moving along. So as to put it, the stigma still remains, but yeah. There is there's definite positive hope. There's work going on. We are seeing, you know, we are a staffing company. We work with many clinicians in helping them get placed, you know, have job opportunities, yeah. connect them directly with the employers, et cetera. And we are seeing a huge increase in the demand for mm -hmm. therapists and social workers, which I see as a great positive sign because of all the things that you just mentioned. That also probably is a proxy to awareness increasing which is again, a positive sign. Now, um, we're also seeing demand increasing. We don't know if the supply of the therapists and social workers, if it is catching up or not, we have to statistically validate it. Uh, but there is always a demand and supply mismatch with respect to you know, health, healthcare workers in the, in, in the country. Having said that, it's so encouraging that you, know, you have taken up the challenge upon yourself to go do your master's in social work. I'm sure you have a lot of other personal, you had a lot of other personal priorities. You were already working in the teaching field, et cetera. Tell us a little more on how, how did that journey go? Uh, I'm sure it came with its own challenges where you're now pursuing your new master's, you're going back to school. How did that go? And you know, what kind of positives did you take away from earning another master's degree? Thank you for asking that question and giving me the opportunity to share that with the viewers. And I hope through my journey, they will be inspired to find their own niche and passion. It could be in this field or any other field. You know, I make a point to say that I do have two masters and if this is not to show off, this is really to encourage people that if they still have passion to pursue another career or another degree, go ahead, go for yeah. it. And we can put barriers day and night you know, against what we need to do. But it, yes, it's, it's, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's maybe it will be financially, um, you know, challenging. Uh, perhaps you're going to lose out on some social events, but you have a goal. And if you have a goal that you're working towards, everything else will align to that. Uh, I've been wanting to be a therapist for the last 20 years, believe it or not, but it didn't come my way. An mm. educational um, path came my way in a different way. I have my master's in education. I was a teacher, I was a principal, but I really never let go of the dream of becoming a therapist because I knew I had uh, the heart for it. You know, being a therapist is not something that you just go to school and get a degree in. I don't believe that. Yeah. You really have to have the heart to be with people, to connect with people, because you really are dealing with people's vulnerable moments they're telling you things for the first time at times they're telling you their secrets and their trauma and they want you to guide them and and facilitate that space for them to feel unjudged and and fully uh, heard and to process their uh, difficult moments and even the embarrassing moments so you need to have a heart for that 
you need to have the passion to connect with people. And it's very important for the clinician to have done her or his own inner work. Yeah. It is very important for the clinician to have looked in within to look at biases and judgments and upbringing and the and the and the and the effect of religion and culture on them to see where they stand on different issues. Because if you come to the session with limitations, you're going to limit other people's ability to heal on their journey. It's not about you. Their journey yeah. is not about you. It's about them. And if you bring your stuff, for the lack of a better word, you will really hinder their possibility to shine in this world. So it's very important for the for the uh, clinician to have self-awareness, to have cultural competencies, to be able to work with cases, even if they are not aligned with his or her own lifestyle or religious beliefs, to be able to facilitate that space for people to just be and uh, to really do it with passion, not to do it because, oh, you know, it fell on my lap. Oh, it's a degree I got to truly love to connect with people and see them on their way to healing. There are so many yeah. people who are in a broken place. And if we all look at each other from our broken place, we will never see each other in our healing journey. So to, to really see people in their potential as they undo the barriers on their healing journey. No, that's absolutely well said. Well said. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Thanks for sharing that, Iman. Um, you know, you did you did mention this was a dream of 20 years and got me to thinking how many of us have the patience and perseverance to nurture a dream for 20 years? Kudos to you for doing that. And ultimately, ultimately that is showing in the kind of passion that you're talking about your work and um, the fact that you recently got recognized in National Association, featured their National Association of Social Workers. Um, congratulations you. on that. Um, it's just showing there, I can only see great work being produced from you. Um, now, you did also mention cultural and social impact mm -hmm. on people's beliefs, people's behaviors as well as the culture and social potential boundaries slash barriers that may exist in providing the mental health care for patients. Mm -hmm. And we know you do a lot of work in that space. You have greater passion in pursuing you know, the, that area of work. Tell us a little more on what does that mean? You know, what is for, for the network of clinicians that we have majority of a lot of them, clinical social workers and therapists. Mm -hmm. I truly believe this continues to be a topic where all mental health care workers or clinicians you know, are, are trying to educate and enlighten themselves more and more with uh -huh. what's all going on around us, uh, especially now. So tell us more about what does that actually mean in terms of dealing with cultural and social and potentially religious barriers, boundaries when it comes to providing mental health care. Well, it goes back to having a personal self-awareness. You get to see what is the effect of your upbringing, your cultural mm -hmm. understanding to things, the way you relate to people who are different than you, people who have different lifestyle, people who have different religious you know, um, beliefs. You really need to know how you show up in these spaces, in these conversations. And you get to see that, um, you know, you get to appreciate what you were brought up learning but you need to go as an adult through a process, I think, where you unlayer. There are things you've taken from your mom that is great. And there are things that you took in from your mom that's not yours. You need to just keep it with your mom. And there are things that you have learned from your dad that were fabulous and they're working for you and they empower you. And there are things that you learned from your dad that was for him, for him to keep. So you really get to see where your cultural understanding to who you are as a being is limiting you or enhancing your human experience. Your understanding to religion, how is your personal relationship in that religion? See, our parents can put us on a certain path, but we as adults get to choose it, fully embrace it and learn it. Because yeah. perhaps what we have learned from our parents is cultural Islam or cultural Christianity or cultural Judaism or cultural Hinduism. It, you get to really ask yourself, the way I represent myself, is it aligned with who I am? 
because from that you'll be able to create the experiences that you will have in front of you, including the healing journey that you will help your clients through. If you are limited within yourself, you're going to project these limitations. And I do believe that every client we come across has a little piece of us in them and we might get triggered. So if you haven't looked at yourself and you haven't been aware of how you show up, you're going to lose control in the, in the, in the session and you're going to make the session about you. See, it's okay to be triggered, but it's okay to collect yourself and remember, I am not here for me. I'm here for them. But it takes a lot of self-awareness and to actually for therapists to go to therapy. You know, I have a lot of uh, therapists who only see therapists. And that is very important for you to also give yourself what you are providing for others. That's a great point. So what you're essentially saying, just, just to make sure I understand it correctly, is more and more self-awareness of the who you are, how you're presenting yourself, what triggers you, um, is only going to make you a better clinician when you're providing you know that that healing environment and healing solutions to the to the patients irrespective of frankly whether it is just therapy work or whether it is physical health primary care irrespective of Absolutely. that i think more and more self awareness for clinicians to do that so and, and i think it's important in all relationship i'm sorry in all the oh, relationships yeah. that you have because it really creates depth it it, it really it makes yeah. you arrive to that relationship ready to create from where you're at rather than from where everything else have taught you to be like really truly mm -hmm. you're owning who you are in every relationship that you're creating absolutely no that's a great point i have two follow-up points sure to brainstorm with you on that um one is there is you said there is more to just getting a degree and practicing your therapy work or social work and you just mentioned there is more to it one portion of being more to it is continuously educating and enlightening yourselves about your inner self, your self-awareness, how you're presenting and things like that. Are there suggestions, recommendations or your own personal experience on how to do a greater job at it? Like, are there trainings? Are there discussions? Are there resources for people to go to, to continue to do more of that and be more educated about oneself so as to become a better clinician? You know, as like I said, you know, as demand for patient care is growing, mm -hmm. demand that also is very pressing in terms of having more great quality clinicians who can provide more in-depth care, not just scratch the surface. I mean, that topic continues to continues to come up in every profession, you know, or as we are monitoring the actual volumes of healthcare workers needed, are we also monitoring the quality of the healthcare work that is needed, et cetera, et cetera, right? So how does one, let's say mental health workers, how does one continue to train himself or herself in this area of being more self-aware to continue to become a better therapist on an ongoing basis? What are the resources that are available? Uh, to me, the people who have inspired me and continue to inspire me on my journey, those are the people who read. It is very important for the clinicians to read, read about various cultures and various diagnoses and different cases and different things about the world to really be a, a well-rounded clinician to be able to handle different cases, however they come their way. And to really be open to embrace the limitations of that clinician say, you know, I don't know about that. I'm willing to learn, to have the flexibility and the willingness to learn is a great skill for the uh, clinician to have. Uh, ongoing trainings, absolutely immerse yourself in different online trainings that are offered throughout the year for clinicians and, and sign up for trainings from different countries. Hmm. You will see how people approach mental health in a very diverse lens. It's beautiful to see what people bring to mental health from a different uh, parts of the world. And to... Um, Keep a good company of clinicians who think alike, who you get, you feel like they are in alignment of your style of therapy and collaborate, you know, especially those who get their license and they end up being in uh, 
private practice, it is very important to keep in touch with those who are in the in the field for you to grow. You don't want to ever hit plateau. When you yeah. hit plateau, you'll end up sounding the same in every case and every session, and you will get bored of your own profession. You need to you need to enhance your creativity. Yeah. You need to always make sure that you're bringing something new. Be willing to learn, and it doesn't matter how old you are coming in this field or how old you'll get in this field. Really be flexible and always willing to learn, and accept that your client will teach you sometimes. Yeah. You don't know everything and you don't know their story. Be open to learn. So be, a, you know, a, a, um, a, a life student, a student of life. That's what it is. A student yeah. of life and read. It's very oh, absolutely. important. Yeah, it's that's really a great vocabulary. That's a great point. I was, um, I was talking to a physician. He's a physician leader, a great businessman as well. One of the rare breeds I've, I've, I've seen. Great physician as well, physician executive. And he actually ended up telling me that he reads about 200 books a month. And I'm like, what? 200 books a month? And then I he want talked to about a list of people that inspire me. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I mean, he, he inspired me in a different way. Absolutely. That's amazing. And I, was like, and I was like, how does that even work? You're a physician who are busy every day. He's like, yes, my friend, use technology. There is, he uses an app which actually, based on his preferences and his areas of oh, okay. interest, yeah. summarizes the books into synopsis for him and then on his drive reads those synopsis back to him so he uses oh, all I his see. drive to actually get the sounds. summary of the books and then like the quick notes. i mean that serves him but one thing that he really inspired me on was like continue to learn continue yes. to read continue to listen i mean you know one of my good friends just forwarded me a podcast like listen to it so there are a lot more opportunities now Absolutely. to kind of enlighten yourself than before. So you bring up a good point. Continue to read. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you have recently read or listened to that has inspired you that you want to share with our audience? You know, I am uh, working on a book called Trust that mm -hmm. I've read several times. I can't find it right now. Okay. And there is a book called The Gift of Therapy. It's That's good to read things that you want to enhance in your character as far as you know, you as an individual. And a new skills that you want to inquire as a therapist by reading books that are written by therapists. You know, as you know, the Instagram is booming with all sorts of uh, information and content on daily basis by therapists. Um, I just want the viewers to know that you get to put on your filters and you get to choose what resonates with you because not everything out there is for us and not everything out there will resonate with the, with the, you know, the, the road that we want to take. And not to confuse yourself with information. Information is supposed to bring ease and, and, and uh, awareness and, um, you know, uh, make you feel uh, more confident. It's not supposed to confuse you. It's not supposed yeah. to overwhelm you. So really be choosy and be mindful of what you bring in of information, of input. No, great point, great point. The, the, the second part of my question, which mm -hmm. I, was, I was going to ask, uh, Iman, was... Uh, one of my good friends constantly is um, is scrutinizing my vocabulary to make sure I'm using the right words. You know, especially when you're in certain fields, when you're interacting yeah. with certain kinds of patients, clinicians, you got to be very careful about the choice of words. So tell me about your experience on when you say triggers, right? In a certain choice of words could trigger different interpretations that could yes. take down the rabbit holes. What are your experiences slash recommendations on while providing therapy, while trying to be a great therapist and creating the environments of healing? How should one be more cognizant about the choice of words? One word could mean something to me because of my culture versus it could mean something to else to somebody else because of their culture or upbringing. If from a therapy perspective, what should be some of the guardrails and guidances the clinician has to follow and be aware of all the time to make sure there is always the right choice of words. That's an honestly a very excellent question, but I wanted to say something about your friend. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> part of healthy growth and part of us becoming 
um, to, to, for us to reach our higher potential, it's very important to allow ourselves to surround ourselves with those who would invest in us in such a way that would want to always improve our skills. Maybe that friend gets on your nerves, but that friend cares. That friend really. You're just really boosting her it. ego right now, but oh, it's totally she, fine. <laughs> <laughs> totally fine. <laughs> no, no, but really, um, it's 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 part of a healthy mindset is to surround yourself with people who would give you that uh, constructive criticism, and for for you to give it and for you to receive it, that is part of a healthy, flexible mindset in a person. So I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. Uh, you are very. Right. Some words can trigger people differently or can sound differently or can bring up issues differently or can make people think of their hurt differently. That's why it's very important to uh, connect with the person and really the first two, three sessions, like really listen, actively listen, get to know their story, get to know their journey, get to know who they are. You don't know who walked through your doors until you listen. And from listening, you're able to gather that person's um uh, way of thinking and style of speaking and the way that you want to approach that person. So you will not be the person who will hinder their ability to grow, but rather a person who will enhance them through whatever they are sharing. So really um, spending time to know the person and to gather more information about what brought them to you will get you to connect with them uniquely and differently to suit their case. Oh, that's a great point. Absolutely. I think uh, I think active listening mm -hmm. and understanding their story so that you can then present your environment according to what they would need for them to heal is, is the best way to go about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a, a follow up to that is now we have seen a lot of digital healthcare solutions evolve you know, in the last uh, 10 months, more than the last 10 years, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, all good. You know, I think I think it's a positive sign. It's statistically it's showing to increase access. Hopefully it'll continue to be on the growth curve. So with that, exactly with, with technology, you know, making its inroads into, into such kind of healthcare and digital therapy evolving, etc. And and one one quick note to there is we we had um, the dean of social work at North Carolina State University on our podcast once, and she said she made a very important point, which is you know that they made sure she personally made sure a lot of their outgoing students uh, actually were fully trained on some of these digital techniques, like you know what do you need to do? You know, I'll give them all iPads and then you know try to get some. Uh, clinical time providing digital therapy. I think that was that was the smartest thing to do, so that people going into the you know outer world to provide their practice or to practice and provide their care are already trained on digital techniques. So with that growing and therapy, typically has always had you know just like even physical health care always had that personal touch with the clinician. Now I think the personal touch is being facilitated more by the digital means, especially with all the COVID restrictions, et cetera. What are you seeing as, is that is that helping? What do you want to see potentially as you continue to grow your work and provide mental health care beyond the boundaries? How do you envision in using this digital health care methodologies to continue to improve the care? I think as our world changes, one of the social work um, components is to be flexible and to adapt and to change as the world is changing and everything is being on telehealth and social media and uh, using these technologies. It's very important for the social worker and any mental health clinician to equip themselves with these advancements. Um, especially that we are seeing more and more college students and high school students and even younger students are taking part in, to, you know, uh, this telehealth sessions. And mm. that's actually their world. <laughs> you know, the tech world is their yeah. world. In order for us to connect with them and serve them, we need to be able to provide that. And honestly, for our own safety, for our own safety as clinicians, we would want to be you know, versed in the technology world because it's not really safe right now to do in-person sessions. 
and we want to be able to continue supporting these people. Uh, in the very beginning of things going online, I was very frustrated as a clinician. I was finishing my internship and my degree, and it was very hard to connect with the kids. But, you know, at the end of the day, it was hard for me to connect within myself. So I had to find my inner um, self-soothing point for me to really accept the change and to shift and accept the new mindset of, you know what, it's going to be all right. It's going to be online and I'm going to bring what I bring in a, in a personal session online. And it has been very successful. I'm able to connect with the uh, clients and we're able to have a very strong and deep conversations about whatever issues they, they bring up. So I think it's working and it takes uh, again, again, a journey within yourself for you to say, okay, this is something new. It's uncomfortable. I don't like it, but we get to go, you know, pass through that because commitment at the end of the day is not, doesn't have feelings to something or someone. So if I feel uncomfortable, I'm not just going to quit my sessions. I'm not going to quit the field. Feeling uncomfortable has nothing to do with my commitment of being a social worker. So just going beyond the commitments and the feelings and finding my new normal is very important. Absolutely. That's, again, well said. Um, <clears throat> being uncomfortable and adopting, adapting to how the world is changing is just probably another way of continuing to grow oneself yeah. and, uh, and be Absolutely. out there to, to continue to continue your mission forward pretty much so absolutely i was i can go on and on for sure but you know, um, th this was great iman thank you for sharing all your insights you. etc any any final comments suggestions recommendations observations that you want to give our viewers especially like i said we are doing a lot of work in the mental health space trying to have a lot of employers uh, find the therapists, try to have therapists and social workers, find employers, we do a lot of that, a lot of that staffing work in the mental health space as well. So we have a big network of clinicians that will potentially be watching this. So any suggestions? What is your hope for the future? What do you want to do in the next five years or any such suggestions or any things that you want to share with our audience before you? Sure, um, hope, I always have hope. I always have a positive hope that things will change and improve as people choose differently in their lives. For those people who are listening and they have children who are battling some mental illnesses, I urge you to look into it because you really limit your children's ability to thrive for many years to come. They will be with you until they're 18, 20, 21, 20. At one point, you're gonna release them in the world and they're gonna mix with other families and they're gonna get married and they're gonna have children. You want to be part of the solution, not the problem. So I ask you to choose differently and to look at things differently. Talk to your pediatrician first. Maybe that's the first step to go. Don't go straight to mental health if that is something scary. Just go to a pediatrician and have a conversation. Have a conversation with the teachers. Have a conversation with the principals. Really collect different feedback of how people view your child because at the end of the day, you are invested for this child to be successful in this world. If you have unhealed pockets of pain in your marriages, heal them. We have, uh, you know, a rise in divorce and separation, and that's really breaking the family unit and our sense of security in our society. Really look at your stuff. Take care of your side of the street. Take care of your, your peace in, in every relationship you're in and heal and grow and thrive and stay together and get, be connected and, and reach out to therapists. There's a great deal of healing and uh, empowerment in you learning new perspective and learning new coping skills. There's no shame in it. There's no shame yeah. in you saying, you know, I don't know how to do this. You know, I failed at this. Or, you know what, I do have a problem with this. Just admitting it is the first step of you being, uh, you know, showing humility and transparency and vulnerability. And that in itself will cultivate trust and connection in the relationships. At the end of the day, we all want to be seen. We all want to be loved. And we all want to know that we matter. And you all do matter. You just need to take the steps in enhancing that. For the clinicians out there, as a Muslim clinician, I'll say, may God bless you for the work that you do, because it's not easy. It's the work of the heart. You are you are constantly feeling things in your heart, and you constantly want to tell your patients, you know, don't do this. It's not good for you, but you are not. You can't. You hold back, and you really facilitate 
the space for them to choose and you guide them and you process with them. As a clinician who sees through everyone's, uh, you know, uh, religious background and faith-based uh, uh, thinking and different ways of wanting to contribute in this field, continue growing, continue working on yourself, collaborate with others, continue, continue learning. You will get to a point where you will get that burnout. You will, especially in this COVID where you're pulled in different directions, make sure you take care of yourself. As much as we teach self-care, make sure you are taking care of yourself so you can always give from a full cup. And for you, my friend, thank you for the invitation. And I wish you the best of uh, success in this field in matching the right clinicians with the right positions so they will continue to serve in our society and make this place a better place. I appreciate the invitation today. Thank you so thank much, Iman. Thank you, thank you, Raj. Thank you. I, you know, I, like for everyone out there watching or will watch this, a teacher plus a therapist, um, I can totally see the great things that you're on to. And thank, thank you, you for your time. I appreciate today. it. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks, Raj. Thank you. Thanks for yet another episode. And thank you all for watching and listening. It's again a privilege to bring forward stories like Iman's as a part of our directions platform. Thank you. Take care.